there! Jesus. Welcome back to The Truth is Somewhere, dudes! Did you watch Ninja Turtles recently or something? No. No? I just wanted to mix it up, so I decided I'd try something a little bit okay, different. Well, what What do you guys think? Mixed. It's been mixed up. It's been mixed. Whoa! Megan, what are we radically talking about today? We're gonna radically talk about some of, uh... The haunted and conspiracy type places right here in our home state our of home Washington. State? Mm. Right here in Washington. Washington, D.C. No. No. <laughs> Not Washington, D.C. Uh, so I initially, actually, I was going to uh, talk about this one place, but then as I was researching it, I was afraid that I wouldn't have enough information for us to talk about and make a whole episode. So then I started looking for more places. Mm -hmm. And the best part of all of this is that... Um, most of these places are within fairly easy driving distance for us, so we are going to go visit them, Oh, and we're probably going to make some cool video stuff Ooh. for our patrons. That sounds like patron content. Yes, after visiting this, so keep an eye on social media, because we will alert you when we go to visit the places. All right. Um, but without further ado, the first place we're going to talk about... Um, the one idea. that I was initially looking at, uh, it's called the Afterglow Vista, and it's in Roche Harbor on San Juan Island. Okay. Um, it's just a ferry right away. In 1886, Johann Stafford Macmillan um, acquired controlling interest in the rich lime deposits nearby Roche Harbor, and he started Roche Harbor Lime and Cement Company, which became the largest producer of calcined lime in the West and the largest employer in San Juan County. So then he built Roche Harbor, the town, as a company town, including cottages for married employees, a general store, and company offices. Okay. And in 1892, a Methodist church was built and also served as a schoolhouse for the children of the company's employees. Okay. It wouldn't be the 1800s in the United States without a little racism. Yeah, yeah. We're, all, we're all trying to get to something really quick, right? So there was also a Japan town in oh. Roche Harbor. And it's on the south end of the cove that served as a living place for uh -huh. the Japanese who worked for the company as cooks, waiters, domestic servants, and gardeners. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. So, um, it's funny that we can have Chinatown. Still. But as soon as you call it Japantown, it's racist? No, I think that at that point in time, it was kind of a racist thing, because it was yeah. like, oh, we're going to put them over there. Yeah, I think the context of it is what yes. is actually, yeah. actually racist, not, uh... Not the fact that there is a um, separation, because sometimes that separation is wanted. Like, I think Chinatown is a wanted thing. It's kind of a tourist attraction. Sure. But I think that initially it probably wasn't a no, wanted No, probably thing. wasn't. It probably wasn't. It was said, <laughs> no, no, you guys go over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I uh, can't apologize for our forefathers. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, maybe not forefathers, but you know what I mean. Well, yeah. I guess that term still does uh, go oh, for that, that term works. Yeah, just yeah. normally it's Our we're ancestors. talking we we're can... talking specific forefathers. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the sad thing is, those workers, the the Japanese workers, were buried in the Roche Harbor Cemetery, mm -hmm. but they were marked with wooden markers. Oh, so those are gone. And they've long since rotted away, so they don't even know how many graves are actually in that cemetery. Oh, wow. They're like, there's just, who knows how many unmarked graves. I'm willing to bet they could take some sort of echolocation or radar um, out there now and figure out how many bodies they have out there. I'm sure it would take some time. Yeah. But I am willing to bet that if someone was very interested and wealthy, they could figure it out. Sure. Okay. Yep. So that's, that's the sad thing. Um, Macmillan built a 22-room, three-story hotel named Hotel de Hero after an early Spanish explorer. Okay. The hotel was used as a place to stay for customers of the Roche Harbor Lime and Cement Company or other guests of Macmillan. Mm -hmm. And he attributed his success to his religion, Methodist, obviously, there was a yeah. Methodist church, yeah. his family and the fraternal organizations to which he belonged. He and his brothers were, brother were both members of Sigma... I think it's Chi, but it might be Chai, mm -hmm. fraternity at university, and he and his son were both 32nd degree Masons. Oh. Macmillan also became involved in politics and was the chair of the San Juan Republican Party and counted Theodore Roosevelt among his friends. Well, Fun that's fact. Cool. Yeah, President Roosevelt even stayed in the hotel. It was room 2A 
Um, the hotel is now known as Roche Harbor Hotel, and room 2A is known as the Presidential Suite now. Isn't it kind of um, silly, the trivial facts that we hold on to as people? Oh, the president stayed in 2A. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. who cares? Like, sometimes, sometimes when we go over these conspiracies... Or you read about a ghost story or something like that, and you're like, oh, well, the person stayed in this room. <laughs> and I'm like, great. <laughs> I just thought okay. that was an interesting tidbit of history. That's all. I know. No, I'm not saying that it's not. And I'm not saying that oftentimes in those, you know, ghost stories that uh, the room number isn't important to the story or to the circumstances, <laughs> but rather, isn't it interesting that people are willing to go, like, dig through logbooks and things like that sure. to, to determine that out. information? Uh, and I can understand if you have some sort of stake in it, or, uh, maybe you're just genuine, genuinely very interested. Um, it's just otherwise very trivial. Yeah. Um, when there's lots of information that's lost for a long time that, uh, we didn't hold on to that wasn't as, uh, trivial. trivial. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, so in 1936, Macmillan built a mausoleum for his family, okay. as you do. Uh, in 1936, it cost $30,000, and that seems like a lot of money for a mausoleum at the outset, but when you actually compare that to how much it would be now, it's, like, nuts. It would be $540,000 in 2018 dollars for a mausoleum for his family. $540,000 in 2018 dollars. Yeah, right? 2018 dollars? Yeah. So, adjusted for inflation. Oh, okay. So the way you were saying it, I was like, are you saying 2018 dollars now? No, no, no. Yeah, it would cost... Uh, five hundred and forty thousand dollars in two thousand eighteen. Current day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it was thirty thousand dollars then. Um, the mausoleum is called Afterglow Vista. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's named so because of the way the light plays off the beach at sunset. Mm. And Afterglow Vista is not a normal mausoleum. Um, because like normally you think of a mausoleum and it's like in Buffy where they're like little enclosed like sheds basically, but they're like concrete sheds with like angels on them or whatever. Yeah, yeah, thing. more like a crypt. Yes, like a crypt. Um so this is very uh open. It's big and open and it's it's actually it's beautiful. Uh Macmillan had it designed to incorporate elements drawn from the philosophies of the Masons and the Knights Templar. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Afterglow Vista sits upon a raised platform and visitors climb three flights of stairs to get to that platform. Okay. And the first set contains three steps symbolizing the three ages of man, childhood, adulthood, and old age. Okay. The second flight contains five steps symbolizing the five orders of classical architecture, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite. And the third flight of stairs has seven steps representing the seven liberal arts and sciences, grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. I didn't know a lot of those things were split up the way they were. Yep. Uh, at the top of the stairs is the platform that contains seven 30-foot-high Tuscan columns that are put in a circle to represent Solomon's Temple. The columns okay. are connected by a ring with a fleur-de-lis worked in seven times into the design. What's a fleur-de-lis? Um, mm, it's a fancy French... Like arch? Like, floor, like flourish. Okay. It's a shape. Okay. It's a French shape. Okay. And those were put in the arches, you said? Or they yes. were put into... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the, one of the columns on the west side is intentionally broken to symbolize the work left unfinished upon our deaths. Mm-hmm. And the mausoleum was initially supposed to be topped with a $20,000 bronze dome bearing a Maltese cross to mm-hmm. represent Macmillan's fraternity. Um, the dome was either scrapped to save money or was scrapped to leave the mausoleum open to nature. There's not a general consensus on that. Yeah, maybe he decided that he didn't want to almost double it with just the topping. Yeah, right. I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of attention to detail a lot. put into this. Mm-hmm. Like, there was a lot of thought and a lot of, um, I don't know, about. I'm sure care was implemented as well, yeah. but that's uh, that's a lot. That is a lot. That That is, a, like, that just, like, Half a page you got written there about... <laughs> we haven't even finished on it yet. What? There's more. What? But wait, there's more. Yeah, but wait. So, in the middle of the platform sits a large limestone table mm-hmm. surrounded by six limestone chairs. This represents the traditional gathering place of a family and is a symbol for reunion after death. Okay. And each chair is inscribed with the name of a Macmillan family member mm. whose cremated ashes are interred in the seats of the chairs. Oh, they have themselves put in the chairs. Yes. It's a mausoleum. Oh, yeah, okay. That makes sense. So people can sit on their grave. Yes. So visitors report sensing <laughs> the presence of spirits near the table. 
and those who sit in the chairs feel uneasy. Here's my ass. So here's like... <laughs> Here's my deal about people sitting in the chairs and feeling uneasy. Because I was thinking about it, and I was like, oh, man, I want to go here so bad. And we absolutely are going to go there, because I think it looks cool as hell. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I don't know that I would want to sit in one of those chairs, just because I feel like it's mad disrespectful. I'm like, maybe you feel uneasy because you put your ass on someone's grave. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe it's not because it's being haunted, but, like, you had the audacity to come put your fucking butt. On somebody's final resting Well, I mean, place. how many times do people lean, especially movies and stuff? But how I mean, how on how how odd would it be if you were to say uh, see someone in a cemetery leaning up against a uh, gravestone? Yeah, but their how butt often do you it? go do that as like a tourist attraction and sit on someone's grave? Not a grave. tourist atta- attraction, but like teenagers hanging out in a cemetery. Sure. No, that's true. That's true. On, I, I think... just think it's I. I just think that the reason you feel uneasy is because you know that you're putting your butt on someone's final resting place. Yeah, I don't know. I think the reason someone might feel uneasy is because maybe you're you're suddenly aware of the fact that you are surrounded and sitting on top of death. Yeah, maybe. And maybe you become more self-aware of yourself for a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most people, if you become a little bit more self-aware of yourself, you become a little bit more uneasy. Sure. Um, so, jury's out on whether or not I will sit in a chair when we go visit this place. I really, I feel like it's disrespectful, but I also, like, um, I don't know. Taking a, taking an extra, an extra as if I take it in the first place, um, uh, Bino that day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Making sure I got some of that, uh, or not, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm trying to gas out the spirits to get them to communicate. Maybe. Sure. (laughs) <laughs> sure let's go with that well i mean this seems a little ridiculous so i'm going ridiculous sure let's that's fine mm-hmm. um those who have sat upon the table have felt hands push them off and i like i, st- I giggled to myself as i was writing this part of the notes because i just like remember my mother telling me tables are for glasses not for little girls asses oh, and all i can great. think is there's like some like awesome mom like pushing someone off the table like your butt doesn't go there mm-hmm. sit in the chair for god's sake <laughs> sit on my dead son for god's sake <laughs> Sit at the dinner table? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> some visitors have reported seeing members of the Macmillan family seated around the table and laughing, which is a much happier thing than getting pushed off the table. Of course they have. And supposedly, if you visit Afterglow Vista on a rainy day, no rain will fall on you if you sit in one of the chairs. Oh, looks like uh, we live in Washington. We'll have to aim for a rainy day. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just to uh, sit in the chair and get rained on. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, so I don't know what it's going to look like when we get there. Because um, a couple of the articles I read said that there's been some vandalism lately, and like one of the chairs has been completely destroyed, and two oh, other chairs really? are like missing their backs. So I don't know if they like have gone in and replaced those things. Maybe quarantined it off. I don't know. So That's but we're gonna go check it out and see what we can find. And that was Afterglow Vista, and I was right; I could not get enough out of that for a whole episode. So I'm glad I researched other other things. I guess, yeah. I mean, maybe next time uh, start looking at uh, poltergeists and what they mean. I don't know. Well, moving on. We're moving on. (laughs) We're going to move south and we're going just outside of Olympia. Oh, yeehaw. Where there are hundreds of grass-covered mounds uh, peppering several hundred acres. They are called the Mima Mounds. And though there have been decades of research into what caused them, each hypothesis has either been proven wrong or is not, like, super strong. Okay. Uh, So scientists know that the type of soil found in the mounds developed after the Ice Age glaciers began to uh, retreat some 16,000 years ago. Okay. The first known documentation of the mounds is in 1841 when uh, Captain Charles Wilkes pretty much just stumbled upon them. Okay. Uh, They're all about 6 feet tall and 30 feet wide, so they're pretty, pretty big. Wilkes assumed that they were burial mounds, which makes sense, uh-huh. um, and dug into a few only to find nothing but dirt and rocks. Mm-hmm. The Upper Chehalis tribe has a folk tale regarding how the mounds came to be. I actually really like this. So a tribal member named Thrush refused to bathe or cleanse her face for fear that something bad would happen to the earth. And her people essentially hounded her until she finally gave in and washed her face. And after this, it rained so hard that the world flooded. And when the water receded, the prairie land had taken on the shape of waves. Oh. So that's their that's their little legend about why these mounds came to be. But, like, 
they people were like, oh, they must be Native American burial grounds, and like all of the tribes around that area were like, I don't uh-huh. know. This is what we were told it is. Like this mm-hmm. is our like legend, our yeah, yeah. legend about it. Um, and the most generally accepted hypothesis is that the mounds were created by pocket gophers. And the mounds do contain vast networks of rodent tunnels, but the creation of the mounds by gophers has not been definitively proven. Okay. And no one is even sure if the mounds came first or if the gophers came first. Like, if the gophers were just like, oh, what a convenient place to make a home. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, so today you can visit the mounds as a national, uh, natural landmark. Mm-hmm. This is what it looks like. Oh, it looks like, um... Uh, goosebumps. It's a lot. So there's like an interpretive trail and you can go on uh, like a tour. So you're saying each one of those mount, yeah, 30 feet wide. That that makes about sense. Seeing the houses that are over there. Those are, actually, those are pretty big. That's bigger than I was thinking, even with the trees. But when you put the house, that house right over there mm-hmm. next to it. Um, and by the way, for our listeners, we're going to put these uh, images in our show notes. Mm-hmm. So uh, make sure to take a look at those if you're interested uh, or give a quick Google search, and you'll probably find what we're talking about, too. It actually looks like someone owns some property with a couple of those mounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it a lot of it is uh, owned by the government, and now it's sure. like a national park. Um, so I would think if I owned property with those mounds, I mean, they've got a good 10, 15 maybe mounds right there. Mm-hmm. Dig one of those suckers up. Well, I mean, they've several of them have been excavated, and they've never found anything but dirt. Yeah. You know what? It's probably just... Uh, some crazy by chance, um, natural phenomenon that caused the earth to, to do that. Maybe there's some tectonic shifting somewhere around that caused the dirt to bunch up. That is what, I didn't want to get too much into the science of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the other theories is that like when, during the ice age, when plates were shifting, it pushed ice up. The, like ice that was underneath the ground, it yeah. pushed ice up, which caused the the ground to split. Mm-hmm. So you'd have these big splits, and then when the ice melted, the ground settled back down and formed mounds sure. from where the ice used to be. I mean, that, that is one of the, the theories, but none of it has been proven, and everybody's kind of like, I, uh, I don't know. So obviously, when you go, uh, I don't know. There's aliens. Yeah. Well, unlike most. Um, liquids transitioning into a solid, water actually expands. Mm -hmm. So I think it would make sense that, I don't know how dense these mounds are, and I don't know if you touch on that at all, Mm -mm. how dense these mounds are compared to the rest of the land. And I would imagine over, you know, 16,000 years or however long these mounds have been here, um, they are probably about the same density as everything else. You'd think. You'd think, right? Because over time, gravity is going to pull those suckers back in. Um, But with some irregular freezing and with the ice age retreating uh well yeah i guess retreating is an okay form for that with the glaciers retreating back Mm -hmm. up uh north i can imagine that maybe there is some um freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing that could cause some some points to expand Mm -hmm. and maybe there's just something particular about the soil in this location that isn't in most other areas maybe there is other um occurrences of these mounds but they're in forests Mm -hmm. and we just aren't ever going to see them nobody stumbled upon them yet yeah Yeah, and even if we do stumble upon them we're not going to realize that that's even there because it's covered in trees and bushes oh yeah that's true yeah right yeah that's a thought uh but what's the um what makes this are there ghosts involved no it's obviously aliens oh obviously when you get stuff like this, and it's not, it's not obviously an Indian burial ground, right? Like, if you're not going to go with that trope, mm-hmm. because the Native American tribes are like, oh yeah, that's us. Mm-hmm. Like, they, it just isn't them. Um, and no one can really tell Certainly. you definitively where they came from or how they, they came to be. People automatically assume aliens aliens yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. so that's that's why this isn't uh included in here because also one i think it's kind of interesting but also because people are like oh it must be made by aliens there's no other possible explanation because there's not yet a a definitive this is what caused it people go wild and go okay well aliens well you know maybe there's some alien uh ship and some dad teaching his son how to how to drive and use the tractor beam and he's out in the middle of a field and he's like <laughs> beaming point, up like point it like... <laughs> here 
<laughs> oh, no, okay, point it here. No, no, point it here. No, like they're no. raising the earth from, like, yeah, way just, down below, and not, then you're yeah, like, okay, just, stop. <laughs> just enough, you know, that the dirt gets lifted up right there and creates a mound, and he's just like, yeah. all right, we're going to do this a hundred times until we don't have to, till I feel comfortable that you can do this without me uh, sitting next to you. You're going to operate that tractor beam and I don't want you to practice on any cows because those are precious and we need to make sure that when you pick up a cow, you don't pick up half a cow. Yeah, fair. Okay. I like your theory. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Okay. So that is another place we can go visit. That's that's a little bit further for us. We'd have to probably, it probably wouldn't be a day trip, but it's doable. It's doable. Yep. Uh, we're going to go back north because apparently I don't know how to stay in the same <laughs> general geographic region because we're gonna go north for this one and then south again for the next one yeah you do you You know you do washington (laughs) washington um it's now 1912 Mm -hmm. and the northern state asylum and hospital was opened on 600 acres in cedro woolly washington have we been to this? We have been to this. We've been to We're going to go back to it, though. Ooh. Um, in the early days, the hospital was known to provide excellent care and therapeutic work programs, including farming. Mm-hmm. But in 1950, Dr. Charles H. Jones took over the asylum and everything changed. Uh, Dr. Jones was a big believer in techniques being perfected by one Dr. Walter Freeman, the inventor of the transorbital lobotomy. Oh, Mm -hmm. the lobotomies are great. Mm -hmm. They're real good for you. So Jones learned from the master, so to speak, and lobotomies and electroshock therapy, things we now know today are barbaric, uh, were performed at Northern State Hospital. Um, And make no mistake, like, this isn't something that was unique to Northern State Hospital. Like, this happened... If you're going to talk about asylums in the 1950s era in the United States, you're going to find lobotomies and you're going to find electroshock therapy. That's Mm -hmm. just... Sure. That's what we did then, and it sucks and it's awful, but there won't be... You can't talk about an asylum from that era and not oh, yeah. hear no, those I mean, things talked about. That, that whole... That's a that's a genre of its own now. Yeah, right? Creepy asylums. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a whole thing. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite uh, like book genres is reading about like creepy <laughs> creepy asylums. I oh, now that. they're making... I mean, they make video games around them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like porters in them, and it's crazy, and they're locked in, and they gotta figure out how to get out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Northern State Hospital was closed in 1976, so that's a long-ass time. That was around for a while. It yeah. must have been successful. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> um, so we aren't sure how many patients died while at the hospital, but we are pretty sure there are around 1,500 unmarked graves in the hospital cemetery. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, asylums and unmarked graves are practically synonymous with hauntings yeah, that makes sense uh most of the hospital's buildings are now used as a drug rehab center for the job corps um which is why when we went we couldn't get to the old hospital because if you actually if you do the research and you're reading about it before like i don't know the last three four years you could get to all the main hospital buildings oh. and they were like decrepit they were abandoned. Okay. And you could get in there and you could see, like, they literally just, like, left shit there. Like, the lights that people, like, they pull down to do surgeries and stuff, mm-hmm. still in the building. Wow. And, like, I'm beds sure didn't take still them. in the building. And so there's all these crazy pictures of, like, people going in the building. And there's graffiti everywhere. And there's, like, trash everywhere. Which is fucking cool. Which is why I originally wanted to go there. Yeah. But they've since, the job corps since bought those buildings. Mm-hmm. And remodeled all of them and are using them as drug rehab facilities. Well, I mean, what a great turnaround for that building. Yeah, though. no, but seriously, it's just, like it's it's excellent that that mm-hmm. could be used for this purpose. So now that's all blocked off and you can't get to it anymore, and that's fine. Yeah. But what is still there um, is the old farm buildings. Yeah. yeah. Which we've been there and we've seen. So uh, a big thing about the asylums in Washington State, and I don't know if this is true for other places, they um, were like a work thing. So you would go to an asylum and they would have like a farm attached to this asylum and they would farm their own food. So they were entirely mm-hmm. self-sustained. Mm-hmm. Like they had their own food. They would milk their own cows. They they That's farmed great. their own vegetables. And then it gave patients a sense of purpose and like a sense of calm because they had this routine and they were doing something for themselves yeah. and for other patients. So what you can now go visit is the cemetery and all the farm buildings. Mm-hmm. And they've been preserved as um, Northern State Recreation Area. So they're a state park. And like I said, we've been there before. Last time we didn't go to the cemetery, though, because I didn't know where it was. No, and it was 
pretty rainy and it was rainy and cold it was october because i was doing this whole halloween kick yeah it was it wasn't uh it wasn't the best time to go there yeah but uh my they're i mean they're covered in graffiti Mm -hmm. just like just like the hospital so i imagine it's a fairly similar um experience maybe some of the hospital stuff isn't there which would make it creepier but um my my favorite piece of graffiti was in the um the grain uh silo i don't remember what it was what was it Shrek is love. That's right. Shrek is Shrek love. Shrek is love. Shrek is life. Um, so anyway, I was going to talk about hauntings. Do yourself a favor. Look that up online. There's a yeah. great video with it. You should. Uh, like I said, most of the hospital's buildings are now used as a drug rehab center, but paranormal investigators who have been allowed into the buildings have documented the apparition of a nurse pushing a, pushing, pushing a wheelchair, mm-hmm. and some visitors have reported seeing shadowy figures and hearing screams. You know, I would love to just go into a crazy abandoned building and just start saying stuff when I come out of it. Like, Oh, I saw this. Oh, (laughs) yeah. I saw a leprechaun. People believe me. People might. Someone will. Someone. Someone will believe me. That is for damn sure. Someone will believe you. So that is Northern state hospital. Also now known as Northern state recreation area. Yeah. And we're going to go back out there and we'll do videos and stuff. Okay. So now we're going to rewind back in time and go move back south. Um, we're going to an even older asylum now. Ooh, another asylum. Another asylum. Uh, so Fort Stylacombe served as a military post from 1849 to 1868. Mm-hmm. And then the federal government pretty much abandoned it. Okay. So the Washington Territory purchased it with the intent of turning it into an asylum. And the Insane Asylum of Washington Territory was opened in 1871. Uh, and it, at that time, was home to 15 men and six women patients. Uh, when Washington officially became a state in 1889, the name was changed to Western State Hospital. Okay. Uh, they ran the usual gamut of crappy psychiatric care practices, including hydro and electroshock therapies and uh, lobotomies and all that. They Typical asylum. Sure. Um, the original building is still in use as Western State Hospital. Oh, they've just um, hopefully updated their yeah, practices. Yeah, they've just updated their practices. Well, <sighs> We'll get into that. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, But the original building is still in use as a a, a, a mental health facility. Okay. Because we don't call them asylums anymore. No. Um, Uh -uh. But there were other buildings that were abandoned, and one of those buildings was called Hill Ward. um, And they make the circuits and paranormal websites. And it used to be, again, like, I'm just a few years past when they decided to, like, tear all this shit down or, like, renovate stuff, which just bums me out because I, like... If you were ever going to do something really big and cool for my birthday, find me an old asylum building that we can yeah. go wander around, because that would Absolutely. be the fucking coolest. I might uh, only be able to get you an old abandoned hospital, but uh, <laughs> I'll do what I can. So, um, it used to be that the ruins of these buildings were still standing, and you can find videos on YouTube and some pretty awesome pictures of the abandoned buildings. Like, really cool. But Fort Stylacombe Park put in a bunch of work to clean up the area, which is great. Um, it was attracting a lot of, like... Un- yeah, well, not even homeless. It was attracting, like, unseemly things. So, like, gangs were going out there and using oh. it for, like, tagging practice. And, that makes sense, And yeah. um, th- there's claims that there were, like, devil worshippers going out there. Oh, you know, those, are always... my, those are my favorite. Yeah, the devil worshipping thing. The devil worship. They, they tend to be everywhere and nowhere at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah. But there, was, there were concerns about safety, too, because th- these buildings had been literally abandoned Mm -hmm. just like they they just walked away from them and didn't upkeep them anymore so like things were crumbling and they were concrete buildings that were just like falling apart and so there was a lot of safety concerns yeah absolutely so the park puts in all this work um and they dismantled hill ward and left only the base of a chimney a retaining wall and a few pieces of rubble they chose to keep for an interpretive trail oh uh, I'm so pretty I like disappointed. interpretive dance? Yes, just like interpretive dance. Okay. You have to dance while you walk down the trail. But I'm, I'm disappointed because I'd love yeah. to go see like the actual like falling down building. But we can still go see like this, the items that they have chosen to keep. Okay. And it's now part of this, this park experience. Like it's really cool because what they've done with the park, because it was a fort originally, is they've like renovated all the fort buildings Mm -hmm. and they do on weekends i think it was i was looking at it because we should go do this sometime they have like like war reenactors like civil war reenactors basically kind of thing okay 
Do they do lobotomies? No, they don't do lobotomies. Damn. But it looks like it, they put in a lot of work into it, and I think that's really cool. That actually does sound pretty cool. Yeah, it's like in the Tacoma area. Okay. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah, what I was gonna get into. Uh, it's it's really it's really hard to find historical information beyond that because Western State Hop- Hospital is still in operation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still located in Lakewood, and it has had a pretty negative run the last couple years. So in June of last year, they failed to pass a muster for federal certification and lost $53 billion in funding. What? That is a ton of money. That's a ton of money. Holy crap. And so the state had to, like, it was either it was going to close or the state had to pony up $53 billion in funding. And the state did. They ponied it up because, like... They're the state. What were we going to do without Western State Hospital? Yeah. Because it's involuntary commitment for the criminally insane, pretty much. Okay. So, like, what were we going to do without it? Wow. Um, And the reason that it was, like, they've been having issues since 2015 Mm -hmm. and struggling to come in compliance with this federal regulation, and they've had three years to try to come into compliance with it, and basically the feds were like, you're not there yet, and I don't think there's anything you can fix fast enough for you to be there. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, with $53 billion, I think you could you know, maybe take a billion of that off to fix your problems. I know, right? Um, I guess a, lo- a big, a lot of the problem was they, they're having trouble staffing it. Why? I don't know. Maybe you need specially qualified people. Maybe. They're having a lot of trouble staffing it. There's not enough, uh, like, staff to patient ratio mm. is not very good. Um, they're currently facing lawsuits from former patients who allege that they were not properly cared for and even faced assault from staff and other patients. Oh. Like, there's um, there's this article there that I found. I'll take you there. In a couple of different places um, where, like, this one woman literally said that going to Western State Hospital was going to hell. And this is this is a mental hospital, and it's not just for criminally insane. I said, I know I said that, but it's not just for that. Uh-huh. There is a ward for criminally insane. And then there's, it's, it is a mental health facility for people who need help help okay and this woman literally was like this did not help me Mm. it was going to hell wow and she that woman i think was claiming i think her son's helping her bring the lawsuit but like she was raped by an orderly and like and that's something you hear a lot about uh, like mental health facilities Mm -hmm. is them taking advantage of of patients who are not mentally mentally there. there which is just the fucking shittiest thing yeah it's disgusting um so anyway they're facing they're facing lawsuits because the they're just not taking care of their patients. Um, it kind of like it still sounds like an old school asylum, right? Hey, like you when know you talk what? about like that, I said, it's fucking shit. I can take you there. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's not where I want to go. What you just I said? I want to go to abandoned places. Oh, not, not shittily well, run state sound, It sounds like. Hey, you know what? It is federally abandoned. Federally abandoned. It's true. It's federally <laughs> so there you go. So that is that is Western State Hospital. Okay. Um, I mean, that sounds like a real um, five-star hotel. Yeah. Well, and the reason that I put Western State Hospital on the list, again, asylums mm-hmm. and everything, yeah, synonymous with hauntings. Yeah. And people, before all the buildings got torn down and everything, people would talk about, like, it being creepy and there were devil worshippers there. And, like, so because the devil worshippers were there, then that's, like, adding an extra little bit of a cult beyond sure. it just being, like, this miserable place where a lot of people were mistreated and then died, mm-hmm. where if... You're going to believe in ghosts. That makes sense for people to remain in a like for spirits to be trapped in a place like that. That kind of is logical. So, there you have it. There were two asylums, a weird alien thing, and a creepy mausoleum, and a partridge in a pear tree. tree. And it's all in Washington, so we can go see all of it. Yeah, we can. There you have Excellent. it. Excellent. It might not all happen at once. But, no, uh... it'll roll out slowly. Uh, the easiest one is going to be Northern State Hospital. I mean. Cool. Maybe we'll get some information about it. Turn it into a real uh, documentary. Ooh. Ooh. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, that's what I got for you. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TTIS Podcast. Uh, if you like what we're doing, you can jump on over to iTunes and leave us a good review. Their algorithm sucks. Helps other people find us. Oh, I guess they call themselves Apple Podcasts now. Whatever. I don't know. Um, um. I'm really annoyed with Apple for a lot of reasons right now. 
<sighs> if you listen to it on Apple Podcasts, that's okay. We still love you anyway. <laughs> if you sure. really like what we're doing, you can jump on over to Patreon where you get videos and you'll get to see the upcoming field trips that we are going to take to these cool places in Washington. You can buy merch at thetruthissomewhere.threadless.com. You can mm-hmm. find our show notes, all the pictures and everything at thetruthissomewhere.com. If you have questions, comments, concerns, you can email us at uh, thetruthissomewherepodcast at gmail.com. And that is absolutely everything I have for you. The truth is somewhere, guys. Keep looking. Yeah. Truthful stuff. I'm about to swear.